Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to Winnipeg. Um, okay, so I uh, have my email there if anyone has any questions after the presentation. So first I'll talk about hepatitis B vaccination. And so the objectives will be to understand the hepatitis B serology. So I'll be going over the different um, titers that we look at, hepatitis B surface antigen, the antibody, and the core antibody. And then I'll review the different vaccination schedules. In BC, we're mostly using Recombivax vaccine, but there is Endrix. And um, also the BC Provincial Renal Agency guideline. And then there was a study that I recently conducted looking at response rates to hepatitis B vaccine and factors uh, associated with, with poor response. And then we'll have some cases at the end for discussion. So for background, we know that hemodialysis patients are at increased risk of hepatitis B infection. And basically all patients uh, who come to a dialysis unit, uh, initiate dialysis, any type of dialysis, will have baseline blood work drawn for hepatitis B. And that's because there are so many sources of potential um, infection. There's potential exposure due to improper disinfection of the fomites, like the ch if there's a blood splash on the gloves, the chair, the dialysis machine, frequent diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, there's reduced rates of vaccine response, and um, you know, then they, they are the rare transmission of hepatitis B, but there are you know, potential for blood through blood transfusions. So the vaccine schedule, um, for, for I'll talk about Recombivax. Um, for a normal adult who's not on dialysis, we'll receive just a 10 microgram dose, th uh, three doses at zero, one, and six. And with Endrix B, it's just a 20 microgram dose. With dialysis, with the Recombivax, it's four times the normal dose. It's a 40 microgram dose. And it's also given in a three dose regimen at zero, one, and six, and that's called series one. And the difference between a, a regular adult and a dialysis or chronic kidney disease adult is that, or patient, is that we do repeat the series if the patient does not respond to series one. So if the antibodies um, are less than 10 at month seven, so one month after the series is finished, then we'll give a series two, completely the same, zero, one, and six. And a third thing that's totally different from the normal population is we also will give a booster dose. So if patients do respond to series two um, and over time their antibodies fall, then we will give a booster dose after response to series two. And in a normal adult, the efficacy rate is 95 to 100%. So you rarely get retested for, um, I've seen it, but it's very rare to get retested to see if you've had a response to hepatitis B. But in the dialysis population, the CKD population, the uh, response rate is, quite, is much lower, 55 to 88 percent, and titers will fall over time. So I'll talk about the markers of hepatitis B. Um, the first marker I'll talk about is this hepatitis B surface antigen, and that's in this red zone here. So when, you, when a patient gets infected with hepatitis, the hepatitis surface antigen will rise and it will, it will, it will go up and then it will, you know, it rises within about a month and then it falls after about four to five months. And then your antibodies, which is called the anti-hepatitis B surface antibodies, they, will, they rise about six and a half, that's about six and a half months and they should stay elevated. So there's a time period in here where you could have low antigen and your antibodies haven't been formed. Oh, sorry. Your antibodies haven't been formed yet. So there's another um, factor that we look at, which is called anti-B core antigen. And this rises about two months after you're infected, and it usually will stay elevated for life once you've had infection. There's a different type of antibody. These are IgG, and then the IgM usually fall off, and the IgG becomes positive. So this is what you can detect in that little window period. Oops, sorry. Ah, I need to get up. Okay, so for initial testing, so I'll just, as, just as a recap, so there's the hepatitis B surface antigen, which is HBSAG, and it's a protein on the surface of the virus. It usually comes out about a month, it says a week, but usually it's about a month after acute exposure and it's undetectable after four to six months. And a positive test can indicate you actually have active infection or there are some chronic HBV um, carriers. Um, and anti-HBS, which is the anti hepatitis B surface antibody, appears after the disappearance of the antigen. 
so about six and a half to seven months later. And a positive test can indicate either recovery from an active infection or a response to vaccination. And then the last one is the core antibody or anti-HBC. And the anti hepatitis B core is an intracellular antigen expressed in infected hepatocytes. So you can't detect it in the serum, but you can detect the antibody to it. So that's why we do the anti-HBC, because that is in the serum. It appears about two months after acute exposure, and it persists for life with acute, after acute infection. And a positive test can indicate a previous infection or ongoing infection, or a patient has a subclinical chronic infections, or it could be a false positive. And I'll go over this a little bit further later. I'll keep doing that. Okay. So the, the BCPRA guideline for hepatitis B came out in about 2017, and it's an eight-page guideline with six scenarios, and the PDF is there if you want to get the complete guideline. I've simp uh, VGH, which I've given you as your handout, has simplified it into a one-page version with four scenarios, as two of the scenarios in the BCPRA guideline were kind of very similar, so we've just made it simpler. So we have four baseline scenarios. So if your hepatitis B surface antigen is positive, irrespective of any value, you don't get vaccinated. And as I mentioned, if it's positive, it means you're either acutely infected or you're chronically infected, chronic low-lying inf low infection, or it could be you're a carrier. And normally, if we don't know that these patients have, they're not known to be uh, surface antigen positive, normally when they come to the unit, we already know they're happy positive. If you don't know, then you'd have to check their the HBV DNA to, and if the DNA is greater than 20, that means they actually have an active infection going on, and you'd have to, re, you know, get them treated, uh, refer them to hepatology. <laughs> and these patients, we have to chronically disinfect the machine. So the second scenario is where your antibodies are greater than 10. So irrespective of any other value, if it's greater than 10, you don't have to vaccinate. And it means you've either, why is it greater than 10? You've either had a previous infection or you've been previously vaccinated. So that's an acceptable level of immunity. If the surface antigen, if the surface um, antibody is less than 10 and you have negative um, antigen and negative core antibodies, then that means you need to be vaccinated. So that's your typical scenario, is number three for vaccination. And then number four um, is the kind of the more complicated one. It's where your surface, your antibodies are low, your surface antigen is low, but you've got this isolated core positive value. So what we do is the first, what that, what that could mean is that it could mean the patient could be in that window period where there's an active infection, but your, your, anti, your antigen is low and your antibodies haven't developed yet. So if it's an isolated result, so the first time you see the patient, and this is the scenario, then you would check the HBV DNA. And if it's greater than 20, that means they're in that window phase. But if it's negative, and I'm not, honestly, I've never seen it positive. Um, if it's negative, then you would vaccinate the patient. So it could mean there's a false, po false positive result. It could mean low level chronic infection. Um, and in these patients, we disinfect the machine until the um, antibodies become greater than 10 through vaccination. So what do we do? So we give the series one, which is with Recombivax is at zero, one in six months. And if you go to the left-hand side, so if, they, if their patients respond, so they're after that series at month seven, then they're, cons oh, they're considered a responder. And we just check annual anti, anti levels because the levels can fall over time. And if the levels do fall to less than 10 or your initial response to series one was less than 10, then you go to series two. And if you go to series two, you get it again, zero, one, Welcome and six, okay? And um, so again, in series two, there's, two, there's uh, two responses. You can either be greater than 10 or you can be less than 10. So if you respond to series two, again, you're a responder and we'll just check annual antibodies. And if you're a non-responder, then you consider non-responder. So no more vaccination. And we just check, ah, I keep doing that. Sorry, and we keep checking the antigens annually. If um, they are a responder, we still check um, the antibodies because I said eventually they can fall down to less than 10. And if they fall down to less than 10, then they can get one booster. Um, and if they respond, then they're a responder. And if not, they're not a responder. So the problem is in vaccination in dialysis patients, despite a more intense vaccination regimen, the vaccination response rates 
in hemodialysis patients is still quite low. And there could be many patient-specific factors that affect the response rate. So example, age, comorbidity, immunosuppression, ethnicity, some of these factors have been shown in the literature. So what we decided to do in our hospital is to, uh, we, it was a two hospital uh, study that we did, which is looking at two big, large, the largest uh, um, dialysis centers in the lower mainland of Vancouver. So Vancouver General Hospital and St. Paul's Hospital. And so our objective was to capture the response rate to hepatitis B vaccination in hemodialysis patients following vaccination series one, two, and the booster. And also to examine, factor, fa sorry, to examine factors associated with responders versus non-responders to the hepatitis B vaccine after series two or the booster. And a non-responder, as I mentioned, is anyone who had a, an antibody less than 10. Because, and the reason we did series two or booster for the factors is that you're not considered a non-responder until you fail both vaccine series. If you fail the first series, you're still not a non-responder. You have to get the two series to be a non-responder. So our secondary objective was to evac um, evaluate vaccine uptake, like how many patients actually consent or refuse vaccine, um, examine factors associated between responders and non-responders of all the series, one, two, and booster, and to determine the adherence to vaccination protocol and blood work follow-up. And for adherence, um, vaccine two is supposed to be given four weeks after vaccine one. So we allowed a two-week interval, four to six weeks. Vaccine three is supposed to be given five months after vaccine two. And we allowed two weeks on either side, so four and a half to five and a half months. And the antibodies are supposed to be drawn one month after the last dose, and we allowed a one to two month interval. So it was a retrospective chart review, and we have this promised database in BC where all data and labs, everything gets entered into the system. So um, we would go to the charts if we felt promise wasn't up to date but um, most of our data came from the PROMISE database. And we included all hemodialysis patients since implementation of the new hepatitis B protocol. And so at St. Paul's, it was from December 2015 to July 2017. And in Vancouver General Hospital, it was March 2016 to July 2017. And we excluded patients not requiring the, the vaccine. So it was kind of a snapshot in time. So um, if the patients were already hepatitis B positive, if they were had antibodies greater than 10, so they did not not need vaccine, uh, if there were no non-responders prior to a study initiation, or they were refusing vaccine. And our data analysis, this is our data analysis, we actually did a multivariate logistical analysis to look at factors associated with response rate. So in total, there were 411 patients that we looked at. And um, we excluded 251, uh, 14 because they were hepatitis B positive already, or uh, 10, 20, 202 because they were already um, had antibodies, and 26 were no non-responders. Of the 169 patients that were left, we had to exclude another 27, um, as nine actually refused vaccination, and 18 for some reason or not, no doses were given. So we ended up evaluating 142 patients and 165 vaccine courses. In series one, there were 83 patients. In series two, there were 60 patients and included 24 patients from series one. And in, um, the booster was in 22 patients and included one patient from series two. So these are our patient demographics. Uh, St. Paul's at the time of the study had a larger unit, actually BGH now has a larger unit. So about 57 of the patients came from St. Paul's, and the patients have had an average age of about, you know, about 69 years old, and uh, you know, th two-thirds were male. And interesting, our ethnicity in BC, we are the catchment for um, a, a large area. The, the St. Paul's and VGH are the catchment for Richmond, which is a predominantly um, East Asian area. Um, and also, also East Vancouver, so we would be the initial catchment. So we had a similar amount of Caucasian versus East Asian. Uh, South Asian was our next largest group, and Filipino was the third largest, and then there was a smattering of other ethnicities. And comorbidity, being on dialysis, we know diabetes was our number one comorbidity, 62%. We had good uh, urea reduction ratio, which means that patients were well dialyzed. And interesting, we had core for, uh, for core positive, we had about 22% of patients who were core positive. And so this was our response rate. Um, was for series one of the 83 patients, there was a 61% response rate. Series two, 60 patients, there were 58% response rate. 
But the booster, we actually had a very good response, 80%. So it's, we're kind of similar to what the literature showed, which was not that great a response rate. And looking at our primary outcome, um, it has, the, 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 the values that we put into our multivariate analysis were hospital. It was not significant, but it was less than one, so we added it to our um, multivariate analysis. So um, as far as response versus non-response, it looked like St. Paul's had a slightly better response rate than VGH. We put in age because a lot of the literature has shown that age could be a factor for non-response. But the only one that in our univariate analysis that was statistically significant was adherence to protocol, which we found um, that it was a better response rate if there's better adherence. So in our multivariate analysis, we found uh, for a primary outcome that it was just, uh, it was a trend that um, adherence was, uh, was a, a trend that hit adherence that could affect response rate. When we looked at our secondary outcome, looking at series one, two and the booster, and it removed um, all overlapping patients. The estimated odds of response for an adherent regimen was 2.2 times greater if the patient was adherent, if the, the whole regimen um, was followed appropriately than if it was not. And when we look at adherence, we can see from vaccine, uh, that these are the two sites. So from vaccine one to vaccine two, it's usually pretty good, but there, it tends to fall off vaccine two to vaccine three, vaccine three to blood work, missed doses or several missed doses and in series two similar vaccine two to, to vaccine three is not so great follow-up vaccine and we can see with the booster the follow-up vaccine for the booster was actually quite poor so we found that vaccine response rate for hemodialysis patients was similar to the literature and we did have but we did have a good response rate to our booster probably because there's an amnestic response so once patients have responded they remember and they're able to respond again we did find that adherence was an important factor in determining response. So we've done a lot of things in our unit to try to improve adherence. We do now by annual uh, checks, we have these hepatitis B records, which I've given you as a handout, and um, nursing along with um, our nurse educator and myself, we review these records just to make sure that they're being followed and doses aren't missed, um, and follow-up lab, lab values are done. We also do double checks by Allied Health. So once a year, we actually do all our hepatitis blood work at our hospitals every June. And this year, um, either the nurse educator or myself met with the nurses who are in charge of four to five patients, and we went through all the hepatitis records with them. So every patient was seen by one of us. And most of them are easy to interpret. There, there's always some odd case that you're just not sure what to do. So we review that. And uh, we also, when I do, uh, we have a, a um, a computer printout of patients medications and anyone who's on a hepatitis vaccine I actually add to that list so when I do my med reviews I quickly it reminds me to check to see if the if values are being followed up appropriately we've also tried to improve documentation of when to draw the levels and we have a cardex and we write it in two different places of when to draw your um, follow-up anti um, antibody level and plus an um, annual in-servicing and just looking at uh, so some other literature um, reports, looking at um, <coughs> response rates to vaccination to hepatitis B. This was a trial. It was a trial done in 2014, and they divided. There was uh, they used Endrix, which is a four dose regimen, zero, one, two, and six, versus the Recombivax I mentioned is a three dose regimen. Um, and they looked and they looked divide the responders into poor responders and good responders. So poor responders are when were when the anti HBS levels are between 10 and 100. They had 22% were poor responders. And good responders is if the response rate is greater than 100, for your, your actual level is greater than 100. And that was 37% of their caseload. And they found there was, like as I mentioned, for some reason these patients um, have, a, have a trend to reduction in antibody titers at one year. But they found that 55% of poor responders had antibody titers fall to less than 10, which means they're not protected anymore and none of the good responders had antibody levels fall to less than 10. And um, yeah, and so other factors, um, other um, trials that looked at factors influencing response, looking at univariate analysis um, trials, uh, diabetes, hypertension, um, other trials have found, as I mentioned, age, low dialysis adequacy, dialysis vintage. We did not find any of these, but again, we had low numbers in some of these cohorts. 
So some of the limitations of our trials that we had limited numbers of subgroups for ethnicity, uh, we had small numbers of uh, other than East Asian and um, Caucasian. Our uh, numbers were lower in the other groups. Comorbidities other than diabetes, we had low numbers um, for HIV, you know, HIV status. It was a retrospective design. It's possible that not all vaccine doses are, were documented in the chart or in Promise. It was difficult to differentiate past versus, versus present conditions. So, for example, does a patient currently have cancer or does previously have cancer? They're treated. And it was difficult to assess if a missed dose or a late dose, and this has to do with adherence, was due to an acute hospital admission or maybe the patient was on vacation because we don't vaccinate once patients are acutely in the hospital. We'll wait till they get discharged. So in conclusion, I've gone over the different markers. So basically, if they're surface antigen negative, if they're core negative or positive, but they have low antibodies, we will vaccinate. Um, I reviewed the hepatitis B vaccination schedules with the two series plus a booster. And I've shown that the response rate to vaccination is low, but the booster actually does have a good response rate. And in this trial, we found the factor associated with per response was non-adherence to regimen. So for now, I'll review some cases. And uh, if you want to open up the mics, I guess. Our mic is open, so if all the other sites would like to open up their mics and participate in the discussion, we would appreciate that. Okay, so this PH is a 53-year-old. These are all actual cases. So this is a 53-year-old a female who received uh, hepatitis B vaccination. She got her Series 1 in 2015, and her level was 5.5. So she received a Series 2, so that was less than 10. She received a Series 2 in 2016, and her, she was a, considered a responder. And so we check antibody titers annually, and in June she was still fine, but in June of 2018, her titers fell to 9.1. So what hepatitis vaccine, vaccination should this patient receive, if any? Okay, so I have, did everyone hear that or? Okay, <laughs> can't see anybody, but um, yeah. So the answer is this patient should receive a booster dose and we should repeat to anti-HBS levels one month after the booster. This, I would have to say when I, we reviewed our charts, this is commonly missed. Like they, this is not, it's just a misunderstanding of when to get a booster or not. So now what if this patient, this is, I don't I've, I've heard that there's some transplant people out there. What if this patient received a renal transplant in June, 2018, which she did. And unfortunately, her kidney never opened up initially, and um, she's still requiring dialysis, and she's on top of this prednisone and mycophenolate. Would you have to delay vaccination? Does anyone know? <laughs> any, are any transplant people out there? <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't know. Yes. yes to what? To wait. To delay, yes. Okay, so that's correct. So post-transplant, it's just that you're showing no compromise, you probably won't respond. So with regular immunosuppression, and also in the first three months, they don't want to stimulate your, your immune system to maybe create an antibody against something that you don't want. So um, usually you wait three months after regular immunosuppression. If the, if the patient had received rituximab or ATG, um, then you have to wait six months. So in my unit, often I don't know, so I usually just wait six months. So this was June, so I've written in a chart, in December she would get her booster. So to be on the safe side, um, in this case, because otherwise you have to go back to all the charts and figure out what they got, I just wait six months for the booster. Any questions on that? Is the patient still on dialysis? That's yeah, question. unfortunately the patient's yeah. still on dialysis. Okay. Her kidney never opened. Okay. Yeah. So they might have started tapering her immunosuppression. At that they probably year. are, yeah. yeah. At this point, she's actually, she actually is acute, has acute hospital admission right now. So, yeah. but um, yeah, so her immunos, like they were, it was quite active for three months um, mm -hmm. and she got admitted in October. So now I'm not sure what's going on, but I think they are taped. I think she got an infection and pretty sure she's probably on any immun immunosuppression now. Do you have data on what the response rates are if you're getting full immunosuppression? Like for, we have people that are living related donors who have failed kidney transplant. Yeah. Come back on dialysis. And well, in, in the, like in the other, other studies, they've shown that immunosuppression is a risk factor. In ours, we didn't because, again, we didn't have that many immunocompromised patients in previous renal transplants. So we didn't see a difference. But I would assume that um, normally if a patient, like if we have a lot of patients who have multiple myeloma, they're in in going through chemotherapy, we actually will delay vaccination until it's over because we're assuming it's not going to work. So, 
I'd say, I have to say, probably not good response if they're on full immunosuppression. Okay, so here's the second case. AJ is a 74-year-old male, new start dialysis. So this is his baseline blood work. His surface antigen is negative, his core antibody is negative, and his HBS, his antibody is negative. So what vaccination series should this patient receive? This is easy one. <laughs> so, series one. Okay. So what if, this is what you saw. This is the confusing one, which we do see every so often. It's like, what do we do now? So what would, what, um, what would you do now? Should the patient still receive series one? As long as what you mentioned was under twist. Yeah, the DNA. Yeah, so, DNA we, yeah, so, what we, so we, when we see this, the first thing we'll yeah. do is um, we have to do a check, the DH, you have to check the hepatitis B virus DNA. If it's less than 20, because 20, I guess each lab is different, but in BC it's 20. Um, if it's negative, then you just vaccinate, but you have to clean the bleach the machine because these patients are still considered potentially infective. They can reactivate. So when, how does that, how is that ordered in your unit, like the, um, <coughs> the, the core uh, antibodies? It's part of a series. Yes, yeah, because tick, we, tick. we don't necessarily. Oh, you don't do the core? No. Like, I see it happen, like I've probably seen so this is a new one since our 2016. It came out like in really in 2015. Like we kept refining our guideline, but yeah. it started about 2014, 15. It's like, oh my God, we gotta start worrying about the core. Yeah. So, so this came from the BC Center for Disease Control. Yeah, no, balance. we do it. Every patient gets it. So if they're positive, we um, have to uh, clean the machine um, every run with the, you bleach the machine specially every run until their antibodies are greater than 10. These patients actually do tend to respond. I find that um, with our core positive patients, we actually, in our study, we had about 22% were actually core positive. And in a study, 80% responded, really good response. So it's probably some anamnestic response. They probably had the infection, some sort of underlying, or they were exposed. We have a lot of patients that come from third world countries. Mm -hmm. They're probably exposed. They have this, you know, and you, you vaccinate them, and then they're fine. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, but we will disinfect the machine until it's great. We have just, I think, one patient who never responded. There are a couple in our unit, and they're, we're back. We have to bleach the machine every time, just as if the hepatitis B positive. So the other point of just making sure that they're not, by, by testing antibody, uh, the antibody core, you're making sure that they're not actively infected. Yeah. But you're also using it as maybe a, as a predictive tool then if, to see if they're going to respond? or No, not, a, no, not necessarily, but um, it's just because it's positive. They are have, have they could reactivate, so we treat them as if they're core as if they're hepatitis B, kind of uh, as if they have hep, hep B until we get the antibodies. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, for example, these type of patients, like if you have to give them like rituximab, I had a patient like that that was like this. Um, they can reactivate, and so hematology we have to put them on uh, tenofovir prophylaxis, because it so it, so they don't reactivate. They're, not, they're just considered a high risk group. And when you guys made that decision to measure the antibody core, was that because of certain guidelines or was that... It was for the BC Center for Disease Control. Oh, like they kind of guide us. And so that came out as about 2015. They, you know, our nephrologists, oh, you know, this is, we have to start doing this. Yeah. And then when we created our guidelines, that was all obviously incorporated into the guideline. Yeah. So the main difference is we use Endrex here. So we use the four series. Yeah, Andrew, we yeah that's fine. We also get... We Endrex. switch back and forth depending on what yeah. supply just happened the last... Four or five yeah. years we've had for combat vaccine. Anyway, with our antibodies, we actually don't get like a specific titer number. We get positive or negative. That's oh, it. Yeah, that's interesting. Get, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's because the higher titer you get, because okay, yeah. well, you'll see my next case. Yeah. I'll show you. Okay, yeah. this is why I'll show you. Okay, so here's case two continued. So vaccination. So we so we're giving vaccination series one. Um, that core positive patient, February second, she got her first vaccine, or he as a he right, um, March fourth. Um, the vaccine two, so it was given a little bit. Yeah, so it was, it was a month later, yeah. And August sixth, this patient's due for vaccine three. However, all our June blood work is all our hepatitis blood work is drawn in June, and it's too hard to differentiate who gets it, who doesn't, who's in a series, and who's not. The entire unit just gets um, the hepatitis tigers. So um, in June of twenty eighteen, the unit annual blood work is drawn, and her anti HBS is one hundred and five. So the nurse, you know, is wondering, does this patient receive? The, the, should the patient receive vaccine three? And for you, should they receive three and four, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you yes. think? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they should. And this does come up in the unit. Comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. It's yeah. always best to complete the series because you want to obtain as high an mm -hmm. antibody body titer as possible. And in this patient, she actually ended up with 800. So the, I, I, that, and that's the reason why I brought in that previous trial, that the higher the titer, the less chance they'll have to 
you know, their titers will fall off and have to get revaccinated. And, but the interesting thing with this is that, however, we can stop bleaching the machine, which is nice for the technicians, because um, now, her anti now she has antibody levels, so we don't have to bleach the machine anymore. She's not at risk of hepatitis B and passing it on. Any questions on that? Yeah, that's my last case. Yeah, so that's my last case. So any questions on hepatitis from out there or before I move on to pneumovax? Okay. Um, okay, so pneumovax. So this is a fairly new vaccination program that we started at, at um, in our hospital, but I know other hospital sites like St. Paul's has been doing it for a while. So objectives, I'll describe the epidemiology and clinical presentation of pneumococcal disease. I'll review the available vaccine types. Um, there's Prevnar and Pneumovax. I understand the use of Pneumovax 23 in a dialysis patient, um, in BC anyway, indications, efficacy, contraindications, and side effects. And I'll discuss the Pneumovax 23 vaccination protocol that we have at VGH. And then we'll also have a few cases. So pneumococcal disease is a type of infection caused by strep pneumonia bacteria. And it's a, a whole spectrum of diseases, um, typically in our unit, you'll see either pneumonia or bacteremia, but it can include other organs. And strep pneumonia is the most common cause of pneumonia, and the disease transmission is person to person by direct contact with respiratory secretions, so it is quite contagious, and nasal carriage is common. And patients at risk of pneumococcal disease are asplenia, so if anyone knows when in the hospital we get our spleen, the patient has a spleen taken out, they always get a series of vaccines and one of them is the Prevnar and the Pneumovax. Um, if they have chronic lung disease, liver disease, and renal disease, immunodeficiency or HIV positive, and other risk factors are age greater than 65 or residents of long-term care homes, and it's pretty well the mandate of all long-term care homes to give a Pneumovax vaccine uh, for new start residents. So I'll first talk about the, uh, the Pneumovax 23. So what is that? So it's a polyvalent vaccine against 23 strains responsible for pneumococcal infections. It's an inactivated vaccine. Just like the hepatitis, just so you know, it's an inactivated vaccine. And the flu vaccine is inactivated. So all these vaccines can be given together and in, in transplant patients, right? Because they're inactivated. Um, the indication, so the CDC, um, in, I, I believe this is across Canada now, it's a, you, get, you get a free supply um, and it's free in a doctor's office typically if patients are over 65 and if you're in a long-term care home or if, um, and if you're between 2 and 64 with certain medical conditions and the ones I already mentioned and one of them is renal disease. So we can get in our hospital a free supply of the Pneumovax for our dialysis unit. So the dose is 0 0.5 mils, and they just give it IM or sub-Q. And in dialysis patients, we give it sub-Q because they're all on heparin, and so why not give it sub-Q? Unfortunately, hepatitis is IM, so in, with the hepatitis, we give it before they start the dialysis, so it's before they're starting on the heparin. But in the pneumovax, you can actually give it after the dialysis, or but just for consistency, they usually always give it at the beginning of dialysis before they uh, start the heparin. And then a uh, booster dose, so this is interesting. The guidelines in BC in, in Canada and the US differ a bit. Um, in Canada, they recommend a booster dose if they have any of these above listed conditions, so uh, any of these conditions here. In the States, it's a little bit different. I think it's easier in Canada. Like in the States, they say you only have to get a booster dose if you got your fir first dose when they were less than 65. If they're over 65, you only have to give one dose. But in Canada, they just say give the two doses. So that's what, that's what we follow. Um, efficacy, yeah, there is reduced efficacy in patients with end-stage renal disease, similar to other vaccines and waning, with waning antibodies over time, as we talked about similar with hepatitis. So they've shown that, you know, 12 months, you get 48% antibodies, so that's why we give that repeat booster. There's no data that I could find that after you give your second booster, they, they still wane. I thought we don't know, there's no data to say give a third booster. So what about Prevnar? So Prevnar 13 is, as it says, it's a conjugate. So conjugate means that it's got some sort of, um, it's got like, the, an anti, like another um, antigen attached to it, so it makes it more um, um, immunogenic. And it protects against 13 strains most commonly seen in children. It is now part of childhood vaccination. So my kids never got it, but now 
Did your kids get it? Do you know? <laughs> and if you're yeah, if you're young enough that you know this I can't remember, I don't know when it started, but now it's part of your normal childhood vaccination. So um, it's indication according to again the CDC guidelines greater than sixty five. Certain medical conditions which are the same as the previous slide for for the new for the pneumovax, including renal disease, and it's. Unfortunately, in BC, this is different all over across Canada, so I learned the BC coverage. You only can get a free supply of this if you have asplenia. So we got a supply for our hospital for our asplenic patients. I had to fight for it, actually, mm -hmm. because other hospitals, for some reason, are not getting it free. They're going, how did you get it? I said, I'm not giving you my source, right? Because <laughs> I got the free supply. Um, if you're HIV positive, and if you're stem cell transplant, we have a stem cell transplant program at VGH. So it's probably because we were associated with stem cell. They said, okay, stem cell, we'll give for asplenia. You should be getting it for the organ transplants. We're not getting a free supply. It costs about $100. So unfortunately, um, I'm not giving this to my, offering it to my dialysis patients, <laughs> but if the patients are with it enough, I'll tell them, go get your Prevnar from the doctor or a pharmacy and then come, you know, come back eight weeks later. So what you do is you get, it's an IM dose, and it, you have to wait eight weeks, minimum of eight weeks, before you can get your Pneumovax. So get the, so I've had a few patients do that. Unfortunately, some of our patients are too confusing. Pneumovax this, Pneumovax that, so we just give the, you know, the pneumonia vaccine, the Pneumovax. So these are the stereotypes that are covered through the two vaccines. So you can see there's really not that many, there's only like this one that's different in a Pneumovax that's not covered, you know, that's covered by the Prevnar, but so those are the two vaccine series. So adverse effects are somewhere between both. So it's usually limited to the injection site, pain or tenderness, swelling, just like any type of injection. Um, systemic reactions are very rare, and yeah, anaphylaxis is pretty well aware. But usually um, we like to give it not right before the patient's leaving, just because you want to be around for at least 15 minutes to observe. So that's why we usually give our vaccines just as they're getting set up versus at the end. And the contraindications are if you've had an anaphylactic reaction, obviously, to either of them. And we'll postpone it um, if you, the patient's febrile, if they're, H, if they're HIV with CD4 count less than 100. If the Prevnar was given within eight weeks, so, so normally you give the Prevnar, then you have to wait eight weeks. Or if the Pneumovax was, was given within one year, then you have to wait a year to give the Prevnar. So there's a time frame there, which I have in the next slide. So the timing is Prevnar first, followed by Pneumovax. If they got the Pneumovax first, you gotta wait one year. And it is interesting, in the U.S., what they did, they changed their guidelines just to make it so you don't have to remember two different dates. They just say one year for everything. So if you get Prevnar, wait a year. If you get Pneumovax, wait a year. But really, you only have to wait eight weeks. Um, timing with the other vaccines. So it can be given together. Flu vaccine, hepatitis, they can all get it together. I know my nurses don't like doing that because they feel... That's going to be a reaction. Yeah, and you know, which one reaction to you get three vaccines. It's like, ah, like I don't have enough for myself. Like, I don't like doing that. So um, we usually give a, after, we do usually do our consecutive dialysis runs. Like, it's not such a big deal. But you can give them together. And for revaccination, as I mentioned, for CKD patients, we will revaccinate in five years after initial dose for a total of two lifetime doses. And... You know, I get asked this question, what if, what if it's given or too early, what happens? Well, they find that the adverse reactions may intensify if it's given too close, so you may get more induration and swelling. Um, after at least four years, there's no increase in side effects, or so probably four years is okay. And if the duration is unknown, they say just give the vaccine and monitor, you know, the, the site. So I just thought I'd go over... Um, a little bit of our pre-printed order, which we created specifically for dialysis patients. And basically, um, the the first top part of the, of the vaccine is a nursing pre-screen. It's similar to our flu vaccine, like the, but it's a little bit harder because um, with flu vaccine, it kind of, it's only once a year, the patients know they got it or they don't. Pneumonia vaccine, they're always mixing it up with the flu vaccine. Often they do not know. So we often have to call, if they're over 65, I usually always call it, or the nurse will call the doc doctor's office to say, did they get their pneumovax? Because the patients often either don't remember or they get it mixed up. Do you have a provincial system that, 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 uh, no. that the database? That no, I do, that would be excellent. If you had so a provincial we, database, that would be fabulous. So we do, but I don't, yeah. like it's not always accurate. Oh, so Manitoba, that's great because... But if it's in there, at least you know. You know. Right. Yeah, so we entered these onto our promise <laughs> database, but... <laughs> That's you how know. we find it. We find a lot of pneumovaxes given yeah. like less than five years. Yeah. One we might even give a dialysis, the other was in the. Just give it, yeah. So I, I, I typically follow the physician's office because they obviously ha usually have their records. Um, or if they're from a facility, you can almost assume that they've gotten it, so you have to call a facility. So if they've gotten it, so this patient patient got it September uh, 
you know, say saved in September 2011. And then they would be, so then the second part, they would be eligible for revaccination because it was 2011, so five years later would be at least 2016, and now it's 2018. So this patient was re-eligible for vaccination. One time, if initial vaccination was given five years ago or longer. And then at the bottom of the PPO, uh, the action is give the pneumovax vaccine. And, um, and then the last part is um, the nurse fills out the lot number, the date it was given. And then we have two copies. So we have the top copy, which is the white copy stays in the chart. And then I made a yellow copy that I give to the patient. And I say, give it to your family doctor because family doctors want to keep a, a copy of it or want to know, or if they're in the facility, you know, if they're in a facility, then I'll usually fax it to the facility if we know they didn't get it. But um, it's important to give the sheet to the patient mm -hmm. so they know they've gotten it. And I'll just go over the algorithm that we created, which is what I, I was, was part of the handout. So uh, there's a, um, so the first part of the algorithm is you look at the date. So for example, this patient received the vaccine in September of 2016. Um, so that means, um, has the patient received two doses? So they kind of just go through it, no. Has five or more you have five or more years elapsed? No, because it's 2016. It's only 2018. So then I'll write the date to be given. Is it September 2021? And we'll put it on the Cardex. And I also enter it into our um, our promise um, medication records, so that when I do my med review, it will say date, and I'll double check it. And, and, you know, especially when it's due soon, like in December, because. Uh, the five years is up or it's eight weeks after the Prevnar, then I'll write it in there so it's a reminder for us to double check that it has been given. So that's our double check. So if they've received it and um, has their patient received two doses, no. Um, but yes, more than five years has elapsed, then you just give the vaccine and that will be their total of two vaccines. And lastly, yes, the patient received both vaccines, 2011 and 2016. So then they, the vaccine series is complete. And, la, and then the, four, the, la, the, the most common scenario is no, it's unsure, the doctor doesn't, doesn't have good records, you just give the vaccine. It's not harmful. And then you repeat the vaccine in five years. And in the bottom we have a date uh, when the vaccine was given, and then the, on the, on the right-hand side the unit of will enter it into the promise, and uh, this is our promise database. So the are there any questions? Or I'll, or I'll, just, I'll go into cases. I'll do questions at the end. So for case number one is an 82-year-old male does not recall receiving pneumovax, recently moved to reside in a nursing home. So what would be, what would you do? Call the nursing home? Yeah. <laughs> so you have to call the, yeah, so you do. You have to call, you got to call the nursing home to check where the vaccine is given because nine times out of ten in a nursing home, that's, that's they, get, they get all their baseline vaccines there. They usually have their flu shock in there too, yeah. So the Pneumovax 23 is scheduled to be given on the next dialysis run. However, this patient was also due for a second hepatitis vaccine. That run. So what would you do? Are there any nurses here? <laughs> yes. So what would you, yes. <laughs> would you give? What would you do? You can give. There's no reason why you couldn't give. Right. One is IM, one is sub Q. You can, but like I say, most of our nurses don't like to do it. Have you usually given to get? Have you done that before? Or? Oh, so I haven't been a frontline nurse for oh. many years. Yeah. Um, I just find the nurses. Don't tell them the. Yeah, I mean, we actually would say bundle as many. Yeah, if you can. Yeah. Yeah. As I just find our nurses like to just in case they get a reaction, they like to spread yeah, it out. Kind of always instilled in us, but now I know differently. So. Yeah, you have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I know when you go for a travel clinic, they go, okay, you need your hepatitis, and you need yeah. your whatever, you, you, this, that, yeah, you get like five vaccines or something. I think the Canadian so. immunization guidelines as a, as a guideline recommend giving as many vaccines as you can at one time so that you don't, right. so you don't miss any. Like, yes, yeah, so you don't I miss mean, it. Our patients but keep coming exactly. back, Exactly, right? but because but they keep coming back, exactly. But if they're going to keep coming time. back, yeah, but you so can, like I say, you can, it's up to you what you want to do, yeah. So you can get both vaccines together or can separate, doesn't matter, as long as you keep track to give it. Okay, so this one is a 69-year-old female who received Pneumovax in October 2011. So, what would you do? Well, if you know it's two, that it was only 2011, then you can... Yeah. So you can give the Pneumovax now. It's greater than five years later. She now recalls that she received Prevnar at her family's doctor's office last month. Ooh, so now, now you delay it. <laughs> yeah. Delay it for yeah. another... At least it 
Yeah. So another four weeks, right? It was a month ago. So you might want to call the doctor's office, get the date, and then or just do it. Like it can be longer than eight weeks. So you just yeah. you can maybe make it twelve weeks if you want. But yeah, so then you'd have to delay it. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I had for that. If you if you find out that a patient has had um, two uh, pneumovax doses in less than five years, right? Like that, say they were two years apart or something. Yeah. Then would you give another one, but wait five years after the second dose? Because we actually end up seeing that, that happen. Yeah. Oh yeah, like where they've given two two doses close together. Yeah, you yeah. see that happen a lot. And I, what I usually do is wait five years after the last. Yeah, dose. Kind of, because the problem is they don't respond that well. So maybe if it's, it's also their refe well, their feeling if it's given too close together, they may not get as good a well, response. Yeah, so to the actually, second one. Yeah, so I actually so end up yeah saying like in the five. Years I wait at least five years. Yeah, so, so I, I agree. Getting, so they end up getting three, but I wait from the last yeah. dose. If it was two years, of, like say within two years. That's good. I haven't had that situation, so that's a good one. But yeah, yeah. I think I would do that. Yeah. Because if it's, like they've shown if it's too close, you're not going to get yeah. that second one's not working that well. Yeah. So you might as well wait. You know, it's not harmful. It's just, no. There's not, it's, there are these are not harmful vaccines. It's either going to work. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But it's yeah. not harmful. Yeah. And it's probably better in these patients to get it than not to get it. How many of your patients actually end up giving Prevnar 13? Very few. Hmm. Like I've had, I, I actually had a, two physicians um, came and go, I want to get my Prevnar first because they know, right? Mm -hmm. But... It, I just found I started trying to explain about this Prevnar, and then you got to get the new, and they got to pay a hundred dollars. Like, they're not going, yeah. and but so I, at least I want to get them to have the Pneumovax. Yeah, so I just it's just too, it's complicated. But if they have a really good family physician, when I call the office, they go, oh, send them to me first. I'll give them the yeah. Prevnar, and then you know, then I write it out to the patient. You tell me when you got your Prevnar, and then I'll do it. Yeah, but so I have to say very few. So it's not necessarily like a handout that the patient gets when they start dialysis. Because it would be interesting to see if you, you know. Gave the yeah, I think that's, that's a good see, idea. Like, yeah, that, yeah. decision whether or not you want to proceed and get it first. And if it's a younger it. patient that who are yeah. a little bit more with it, yeah, I probably would, you know, stress. But a lot of them don't want to pay the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We've had a, yeah, we feel like. And they, they're already in dialysis three times a week. I mean, I got to go somewhere else to go. Yeah. You know, blah blah blah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate they don't allow the Prevnar because that would be the perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, process. Yeah, like our solid or organ transplants do have a cover here, so the transplant. Oh, do you get transplant cover? covered? Yeah, and it yeah. should be covered. For some reason, yeah. BC won't cover it. Yeah, imagine what doesn't die there. No, for oh, man, which for one does it? Solid or? Yeah, they do. Yeah, for, or but for the other populations, they don't. Like, like we know, yeah. Yeah. Reno does not. yeah, yeah, and they should because they're just they're they acting just for, as real like if you had like uh, your your examples up there, they cover for um, Asplenia, Asplenia, and SCT, yeah, yeah. Do you have a maximum amount of boosters that you'll give? Because we have some for patients for a page, like so. Basically, you give a booster, you test them for the hepatitis. You mean? Yeah, sorry. So yeah, back to oh, back on hepatitis. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you give a, a booster and you test them a month after and they're positive, um, well, that that they respond. Yeah. To. But then by the time like we are in our positive patients, antibody positive patients, we they, they then go to surveillance once every year. So then the following year, they'll get their routine antibody it antigen, negative. and it'll be negative, and then we booster them. Yeah. So I have some people that like end up getting boostered year after yeah. year. Like I just wonder. If I haven't had patients know. around long, out, long enough yeah. to do it, but uh, yeah, the, the guideline is continue Keep the booster. There's no, it, yeah. there's no, and we, we looked into that because Winnie Lowe's the other pharmacist I did mm -hmm. the study with. We actually looked into that because like, how I many, you know, but I mean, the most yeah. I've seen in our group is like two. Yeah, no, our, And then... Sometimes the patients refuse, or whatever. But usually, if they respond, um, if they get a really good response, yeah. I had a patient like was nine, went up to eight hundred yeah. from one booster. So yeah. she's still up, but yeah. it's falling. Like but most people do respond, but I do have like there, the, we do have a handful of people that do respond yeah. the year after. But by that year, I know they're, they're so it's keep it better than to do the measurement, like the. It's, you're still, but you're still going to do it anyways. But it, it kind of gives an indication that they're not going to. Yeah. Yeah. So at least you know. Yeah, it's going to last. This yeah. one's really going to last. Yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. worry about it so much. Yeah, we just get positive or negative. That's interesting. That each to, each lab is different. Yeah. They used to give us a low level. Like they used to give it was positive, negative, oh, and I've low. So what does low mean? That anymore. What does low mean? It was like between. I think it was something around ten. Like it was. 10 well, ten is our cutoff. Yeah. But they, but so what would load? Like you're either negative, what is negative yeah. versus low? I don't know. That's yeah, interesting. I just remember seeing 10 in there, so it was around 10. I guess you could talk to your lab because they must come back as a value. Like if our labs are good value. Like this is all, all of BC gets a value back. Yeah, the lab would have to have a value that would be right. longer between a positive or negative. Unless, unless the machine, I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, never, never. Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If you don't give it, we won't learn it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we and we also give our new one back. So I, I am. So but for the core, so for the for the core, it's just it's just reactive or non-reactive. Yeah. That they don't differentiate. Yeah. But back to the new one back. Now slipping back and forth. Oh yeah. Our new one back is twenty three. We do give it. Uh, I am. It's on our pre-printed orders. So there's a couple oh. patients that have complained, like, "Ow, it hits my bone." So then we've got, like, I've given it. Yeah, I totally bed. switched the subject. So there's no, there's no literature then about the difference in response rate. No, I haven't found that. Okay. Like some vaccines are better given I am, yeah. Um, yeah. but this one says I am. Like I looked into that too. I am or I yeah. sub Q. Like I don't know why. Why would we? I'm sure everyone would like it better. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, no, it's painful. Do you know what the CDC guidelines are? Is it is it sub sub Q? It says I am or sub Q. Yeah. It always says I am first, right? Yeah. What does we, it? we seem to pick everything from CDC, so I'm not sure if that was yeah. the guidelines that were this. this Cali said that yeah, because I, I printed the guidelines. I mean, I'll go through the well, game for yeah, today, yeah. but I, I didn't see anything that said, you know, sub you is I am is preferred for yeah. efficacy. There's also that general rule of any inactive vaccines, I am, live vaccines, subcut. Yeah. So that's what sticks in my brain, too. Yeah. So well, and it's just by looking at the thing, like, during the presentation, reminded me that you know I have done it in certain. Well, plus patients who are on right? warfarin, yeah. and you know, yeah. I know it's nice to give it yeah. sub Q, but yeah. I, like I know, um, I think the the hep, the um, the H flu vaccine, you can, I think you can give it I am preferred or mm -hmm. sub Q. Yeah, because they've demonstrated lower response. Yeah, but we will. I know, like with our Hepatitis patients, we'll give it sub Q if they're on heparin infusion or something like that, right? And they have to get it, so we have given it sub Q. But I know that would that say I am preferred. This one I couldn't find anything that said preferred, yeah. so we just give it sub Q. And we've had um, infection control has been involved with this, so. Are there any other questions? Can you speak up just a little bit more? Sure, I have my back here as well for now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Hey, um, uh, we're wondering if there's a chance of getting the slides from today. Uh, yes, they were actually emailed out, but I can send them out again. I'll send no you the slides. Yeah, oh. I'll, I'll send you the slides with the answers. Like, I didn't oh. want to give you the slides with the answers for the talk. But what I'll do is I'll give it to, if you want send me to send it to me, it and to, yeah. I'll take care of it. And I'll send you the slides with the answers. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you.